us about the straw man. What exactly is the straw man? The straw man is uh, your name written in block letters. Very simple. It was done at birth. What the, the government did, or the corporations now, not government, what they did is they took your birth certificate and made a second birth certificate with a trust, a SISTI QV trust. They made it in all block letters. For, for them to interact with you, they have to interact with you as a fiction because they're all cooperations. Cooperation cannot interact with real people. So they made a straw man. They call it the straw man because it has no soul and is spiritually dead. So let's break this down. You're born in the hospital room. A, a certificate of live birth is issued. What happens is that she has to register the child's birth she has to go to the registration office and register. If she does not register, she will be taken to court according to what the law is saying. They take the birth certificate that she registered as an informant, informing them that she has the child, and they made a duplicate in all black letters. She didn't, they did. So they turned the living child, child now into, into a, a trust, fiction. into a fiction. Trust, yes. Which has a, an, a, a certain value allocated to it. Value, yes. Millions of dollars or pounds. And that, that trust, let's call it a bond, um, it because that effectively becomes traded thereafter. Yes, it becomes warehouse bond for money. So every human being that has been registered to the state or the crown by the mother ends up becoming some kind of a bond that is traded on the stock market. Yes. Without you ever knowing it. Yes without disclosing and they, they, this is happening since the early 1900s. What they've done is really fraud because they're fraudulently taking your child's birth certificate and make it into a dead entity. The dead entity birth certificate is making billions of pounds or dollars, depends on which country you're in. So your straw man is considered a dead entity and the cooperation can interact with it. If you have to go to court, it's not going to be in your real name because they don't have it. All they have is the dead entity and they interact with that. So who is reaping the rewards of the value of your bond as it's being traded? Uh, I would say the, the Federal Reserve, which belongs to the royal family, and the HMRC, IRS, these are the people where your money goes once you are registered. The mother register you, that's where the money goes, to them. Okay, let's talk about the difference between your signature and your autograph. Okay, a signature is under the UCC, which is um, the fiction, the straw man. Your autograph is the real person. So if you go up to a movie star and says, can I have your autograph? You never say, can I have your signature? It's always autograph because you have flesh and blood. Signature is what you're signing every time they can go into your account and take money. And every time you do sign a piece of paper, you can bet that that signature of yours is being monetized, securitized. It is, it is, it is. By the banks, by everybody that you, wherever you sign, credit cards, everything that you sign, they're getting funds off your trust fund from that birth certificate. Okay, so fees and all sorts of things and invisible costs are being discharged against your birth bond in that sense? Yes. Without you ever knowing about Without it? Without you ever knowing about it, yes. It was never disclosed to you. All this stuff was done without disclosing 
and it's deception, it's fraud, and it's it's happening every day to everyone that's outside the inner circle. Okay, let's talk about the court system because invariably your signatures uh, lead you into a courtroom at some point, you know, whether it's for, and, and under the aegis of the court system, whether it's a marriage, a birth, a death, a registration of land, whatever. So we understand a little about the distinction between the signature and the autograph. What exactly is a court of law? Well, at the moment we don't have a court of law. We have a, a color of law, which is fiction. So when you go into a court system here or America, you walk into a system where there is no law. So it is lawless. So when you go in there and you speak to somebody doing business as a judge, there is no judge. You could ask the judge to see his oath. He doesn't have one. He's a cashier. Yeah, he's a banker. A banker. Yes. So when you sign any papers in the court, that's when he gets paid out of your SISTI QV trust on your birth certificate. That's where he gets the money. If you go into the court, you still lose because it is not a court of law for you. In a situation like that, when should you use your signature and sign something and when shouldn't you? There is a special way of, under the UCC, we go back to that, there's a special way of signing without responsibility for your signature. So that if you sign in the special way according to the UCC, you're not responsible for anything that's on the paper. Okay. Now, for the layman, describe UCC. What are we talking about? Okay. What is the UCC? The UCC is a set of codes that was set up over a hundred years ago by lawyers. And with the Uniform Commercial Code comes contract law. It's all to do with contract. So we are not under any law, we're just under contract. Anybody could, someone could call you up and say, oh, would you like to contract with me to, to get a TV license or to get something that you need, and you contract. Telephone, everything is contract, everything. And under the UCC, you do not have to sign a stamp signature or a typed up signature is considered sign under the UCC. So when you get a letter in the mail and it has no signature um, or it just have a stamp signature, then it is considered signed. The UCC is very, very important for people to learn about what's going on with their lives because we are on the contract law, no other law. There is no law at all. In America, the court system is operated under military. When you walk into a courtroom, I don't, I don't care which courtroom, if it's a higher court or a lower court, they're under the military. Now you're walking in there and you're not a military member and you're not told that you've been tried under the military. If you mention the Constitution, the judge says it does not apply in my courtroom. But you don't know what he's saying because you don't know what they're doing to you when you're there. And all of that language is designed to confuse the hell out of you? Yes, it's designed under the UCC and they know. They know what they're doing and they know how to uh, manipulate you. So you're saying all judges are very schooled and versed in UCC? Yes. They're taken to special training yes. schools in order to learn it? Yeah, they, the president appoints all the federal judges in America. And, he, and they go to Scottsdale, Arizona and Reno, Nevada to train how to apply this fraud contract in the courtroom. And in the United Kingdom? In the United Kingdom, majority of the judges here in the United Kingdom are not judges. They're just doing business. They might be a retired lawyer. They're doing business as judge. And so-called judges in, in Malawi and in Canada? All of them, exactly the same system, they're under the UCC. Okay, um, I want to talk about some mundane issues. Who owns your car? The DVLA in England. In the United Kingdom? Yes. Uh, Department of Vehicle, Vehicle Licensing, Licensing right. Agency. Okay. Yes. Well, the DVLA owns the car. It tells you on your registration, you are not the owner, you are just the registered keeper. 
Now, if you look up register keeper, it says the person who is responsible for taking care of the vehicle, pay the taxes, pay the license, pay the insurance, and take care of it. But the DVLA could take it from you anytime they feel like, crush it, they could clamp it. Because once you've it. registered it, you've handed it over, over to the to Crown the, of the State. That's right, yes. It's no longer yours. It's not yours, never. So again, when you buy a car, you are invited to defraud yourself by then handing it over to the Crown of the State unwittingly. Yes, because it's, it's fraud and they're committing this fraud and they're not letting you know what they're doing. They make millions, hundreds of millions. The highway belongs to us. They says you have to pay to drive on the road. You don't. The DVLA is just a cooperation set up by the Crown. All these cooperations are set up by the Crown. The HMRC, the DVLA, they all do the same thing. So if you look carefully at your registration, it tells you right there. And in the United States of America, um, it's not the DVLA, what, what's the equivalent? It is the Department of Motor Vehicles. And again, they invite you to again, hand the, yes. register the vehicle to them. Yes. They become the owner. They become the owner. The only reason to have a license when you drive a car is if you're doing taxi service or doing it for business. But if you're driving for your personal use, going to work, going to the market, take your family out, going on vacation, that you don't require a license. There is no law that requires no. you. You can move about the surface of the earth unmolested. Yes. That's, that's law. That is the law. Yes, that is the law. But that's not what they But these you. fictions, these costumes, these people wielding batons and guns and tasers, they've somehow uh, been given license by the government to apprehend you, arbitrarily stop and search you, terrorize you, rip you out of your vehicle. Who gave the traffic enforcement officers the right to stop and apprehend people going about their God-given business? The corporations that they're under. The police are not constables. And the Queen took an oath to represent the sovereign people, which she's not doing. She's now a corporation herself. So the police is, co is under corporate. They're not constables. Constables are the people who the, that beats the street and, and get to know your neighborhood and speak to the people. Keeps the peace. Keeps the peace, yes. But they're not constables. They're corporate police. If you call a police officer and you know whose side they're on, if you call a police officer and a bailiff is at your door, they will tell you they cannot come because it's a civil matter. But if the bailiff calls them, they will come. That means that they're not working for you, period. They're, they're working, working for the parent corporation. They're, they're working for the corporation, yes. They're corporate police. How many of the police do you think know this and understand this distinction? I think 90%. Do you really? I do. I do. In the United States and in... in and here, yes. Yes, 90% of the police know they're not. They're corporate police. But surely, surely then they understand that they are in serious breach of their, their foundational oath and they should thereby surely understand that the Queen of England is in serious breach of her coronation yes. oath yes. which requires her to intervene if her parliament or government is conducting any cruel and unusual punishments against the people. And it's my understanding that being stopped going about your business in the street and dragged out of your vehicle and beaten with a baton for whatever reason, that to me, by definition, is cruel and unusual punishment. Okay, but they're given that permission to do that by the, co by the cooperation they're in. They are given. If they were not given that permission, they could not have done that. They could not drag you out of your car or molest you or take you to the station for no reason. But it's not a law that gives them the right. It's a statute. It's a technocratic... Uh, words on paper, statutes that have allowed them contractually to go ahead and beat the citizenry, right? Okay, yes. But, but it's not lawful. No, it's not. It's entirely it's not. unlawful. It's legal and it's fraud. Fraudulent activities and they're being backed up by the, their corporate headquarters. So you cannot win because there's always somebody there to protect them and they know that. So let's drill down into this. A policeman is there and should be able to respond to a living soul doing injury against another living soul. If they witness that, they have every right to intervene. In the same way that you and I can conduct a citizen's arrest. If we see that somebody's being harmed, we should step in and try to intervene. 
But that's really as far as it goes. They have no business trying to commercialise human beings and penalise us for walking across streets or for not stopping at an amber light or whatever. All of that stuff is just nonsense, dreamt up by the corporation. It is. Right. Yes, it is. It's all fraud. Everything they do, and that's why they're giving the opportunity to do this to the sovereign people, because the sovereign people are ignorant of the, the uniform commercial code and contract law and how these people operate. They go into the court and they do the same thing. You tell them, don't go, to, even if you don't go into the court, they still fine you for the same thing as if you go into the court. But if you go into the court and the police takes you there, then ne you never win unless you know the law and they know that you do not know the contract law and that you're under contract and you walk walking into a trap. You go in there and the police or whoever is going in there with you, it's always they're the ones who win. You never win. Let's, for instance, say you're driving down the street, you have not hurt anyone and you got stopped by the police and the police breathalyze you and says, I have to take you in or I have to find you or, or, or both of those. Who did you hurt? Who did you hurt? Who are you going to be paying this money to? You didn't hurt anyone. There's no victim. There's no victim. It has to be a victim under the common law. For there to be a crime. For there to be a crime. It's as simple as that. It is as simple as that because to give you a ticket or to book you and take you to the station, who did you hurt? There is no one that you have hurt. That's just a commercial penalty. It is a commercial penalty. Okay, so we're getting the picture here that the, the court systems, the justice system, the policing system, uh, all of these systems are designed to commercialize, securitize, commercialize human beings, harvest them monetarily. Yes. Right. Yes. Very, very little of that expenditure, that energy is, goes towards keeping the peace. Oh, well, none of it goes towards none. keeping the peace. They don't keep the peace. All they do is make, what they do, they, they create the problem and then they find a solution. And then sell you that solution. Yes. And then penalize you if you don't accept the solution. That's right. Right, sounds like a very rigged casino to me, rotten to the core. It is. And it seems to me that the average human being um, would, if they understood this, would utterly reject this system. Of course. If they understood it. Of course. But of course most people are completely indentured to it. Yes. Are mind controlled. Yes. Reading the newspapers, watching the television and repeating verbatim the bullshit that's taught to them. Yes. So the truth is, it seems to me that human beings are not predisposed toward hurting one another. We don't enjoy going to war. No. We don't enjoy no. hurting each other. Yes. In the main, most people get along and just want to get along. Of course. But the systems conspire yes. with a model of scarcity economics and yes. drive war and disease and poverty. Of course. That's the only way they can make money. When, the, when this uh, Prime Minister said she's going to give 300 billion to the, to the common market, where do you think she's getting the money? Not from your wages that you pay taxes on. That's a different set of money. She gets it from your trust fund, from your birth certificate. That's where they get the money to build the roads and do everything you could think of. So they're discharging billions and billions and billions of dollars against our birth bonds without yes. ever disclosing that to us. Of course. Without there ever being an audit or any accounting for it. Of course, because nobody's asking. Right. And even if you do ask, they give you a hard time to tell you about it. So if you try to go and, 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 and discover your own birth bond, let's call it that, and you try to discover the true value, how does one go about doing that? You apply to the Federal Reserve for it. There's forms that you can fill in and you can, once you find the bonds and the serial numbers, you can get it from the Federal Reserve because they have it. And you can then discover the value of your bond? Of course. And the average, let's say, 50-year-old in the, in the United States is, would be worth what? A 50-year-old in the United States, it could be worth hundreds of millions. But one comment, if you go on the website and you put in your uh, birth certificate number and it comes up only one, you have hundreds of thousands of people are trading on it. Right. That's only one that you know of. I think what I'm getting at is what do you think it would be the median value of the average 50-year-old by the time they turn 50 in the United States? What has been traded I would say, in their name? I would say... If 
maybe a billion, over a billion, right. has been traded. Okay. Because when I checked, um, on one of, of my numbers is over 283,000 people are trading on it. Can you imagine how much money that is? So when we hear that the U.S. has a debt of $23 trillion or whatever it is, uh, that fictitious money was all pumped out of the air, but effectively it was discharged against the value of oh, yes. the people. Yes. Right. So that's where the fiction emerges. Yes. And it becomes this huge imbalance that no one quite understands how on earth did we get that much money. They just made it up as they go along and tell us what they want to tell us. Yes, but they'll validate the making up of that money by, yes. on paper, discharging it against the value, value. of yes. the citizenry. And the citizen's gold, our sovereign gold. We have gold. For every pound that you, you if you weigh eight pounds at birth, you have eight pounds of gold set aside for you. Assigned to you by whom? By the crown. In England? Yes. And in the United States? Yes. By the treasury? Yes. And Be because the United States is owned by by the, the crown. Let, let's <laughs> okay. Um, so let's say there's two hundred odd nations of the world. There's hundreds and hundreds of small island states, but there's about two hundred um, nation states, big nation states. They are all of them a franchise of the Anglo-American Corporation. Yes. Let's call it that. Yes. And that the Anglo-American Corporation is an extension of the British Crown. Crown. Yes. And the British crown is collateralized by what, or backed by what? Gold. And by the people. The hundreds of millions of people. The British Empire has just went on the ground. It's still there. Controls the Bank of International yes, Settlements, yes. controls all the reserve banks around yes, the world and yes, so on. Right? Yes, yes. Correct, correct. So, so at what point do you believe the world sees through this grotesque fiction and then addresses the source code, and then writes it. I think if people get to know what the UCC and the contract law does, and their straw, your straw man is your main problem. Once you can control your straw man, and it is yours and not theirs anymore, then you're in the right This is path. beautiful what you just said. You're talking about reclaiming the fiction Shit. that yes. was established, yes. the false light. Yes. Reclaiming the false light that was established in your name, yes. given your identity, so to speak, at birth, yes. without your knowledge, knowledge yes. you're talking about us needing to reclaim that false light and step into ourselves, our true selves, yeah. as a people of the world, yes. in order to reclaim reality from yes. the fiction. Yes. That's powerful. Yes, it is. And that's what... I think everyone needs to do, all the sovereign people that's in poverty and whatever they put us in, that's what we need to do. We need to reclaim that, what they are making money on, that is ours. Then you wouldn't have wars, you wouldn't have people fighting for money, you wouldn't have poor people, everybody will be okay, everybody. But they do not want you to. If you do that, that will break down their system and they do not want that. So once you know, you need to get into it and you need to start reclaiming your straw man. It is yours. Now, Bibi, you learnt all of this the hard way. You were sitting in your office in the United States running a very successful real estate business a number of years ago. Very yes. successful, selling yes. 20 to 30 properties every month. Yes. You had a lot of your own properties, you were living there with your family. Yes. Life was good. Yes. And into your office walked a corrupt policeman and an I IRS am. agent. Yes. And these gentlemen effectively uh, put you on the spot, told you that there was a, uh, one of your clients that you were selling a house to was a drug dealer. Dealer, yes. And uh, which you had no idea. Yes. It's a, you know, how, how would you know? And uh, they effectively then tried to pin this uh, a crime onto you by suggesting that you were effectively uh, receiving um, laundered, laundered funds. funds. Yes. And out of the blue, your life turned into some grotesque horror story. Yes. You, you were dragged into court, yes. and the next thing, you were put in prison for yes. eight years. Yes. Your life destroyed. Yes. Yes. And that was where you learned yes. law. Tell us about this. Well, 
when I was uh, when I went to trial, and I I thought, well, how could they do this? I have shown for ten years my bank statements, so they see that I had no money. No money was laundered by me. The gentleman I sold the property to brought five thousand dollars of his own money, and he got a loan from the bank for the difference. And, and the bank loan officer testified at my trial, but I end up in prison. And I wondered how they did it. I thought, well, there has to be something that I've missed. I saw in the courtroom, it was, uh, what was displayed, it was all acting. Like everybody, like we were in a, a theater and they were acting and, and I was the victim. Role playing. Yes, the, the, the lawyers. The prosecutor, they were all, my lawyer guaranteed my freedom and I got sentenced to eight years. Now, when I got locked up, my main aim was to find out how I end up there without doing, and I had over a million dollars of real estate paid for, money in the bank, uh, my children finished university. We were in a very comfortable, very hard-working family, very comfortable position. And I thought, no, it has to be something wrong, something they did that I couldn't see. And for every single day, for seven years, I learned every single day, Christmas, birthdays, every day. You studied? I studied. You studied law? Yes. And you understand that you un you came to understand the highest expression of law, this UCC law. Yes. And what they're doing, and how they could get you in there, and how they could lie, how they commit fraud, and they all thought it was. They were all laughing when they f I was found guilty. Like, well, they get paid. You see, I did lots of money. I didn't know at the time. And these people, I I was in the prison, and there were hundreds of women that were there, that was in the same position as I was. They were tricked into the system. Yes, yes, they didn't do anything. And then once they're in prison, they're having, they're having a prison bond issued. Oh, yes. And then their prison bond is traded on the stock market, yes. making huge amounts of money. With their numbers, yeah. And they're relegated to becoming slave workers. Yes. And they're not, no one's told this. No, they get 12 cents per day. The food that was served in the kitchen was from the Gulf War. Cans of meat and all kinds of stuff. And they said the prison is not making any money. And they're telling the people out there that the prisons are um, losing money and all these, these drug dealers and all these people coming into prison and we don't have enough money. That's a lie. They're they making thousands of dollars a day per prisoner. I know it's at least $3,000 a day yes, per prisoner. They, yeah, but they are making, they invest into the prison system, into Unicor. Prisons for profit. Prisons for profit. Disgusting. And, and they invest in the prisons and they make hundreds of billions of dollars. And the prisoners get 12 cents a day and the food that they feed the prisoners. Not and, fit for dogs. No, it comes from, from the farms and they get tax write-off on it. The chicken may be two, three months old and all kinds of stuff. They, they serve uh, horse meat for, for beef. Well, you're about to launch an online workshop and tutorials through the Newark University teaching uh, UCC and explaining to people from around the world how they can navigate their um, situation, whatever their situation may be, because all of us are facing penalties yeah. and uh, cruel and unusual punishments. punishments yeah. uh, but let's discuss something as mundane as a parking ticket, okay? okay? Something that everybody understands. What are the do's and don'ts? You've just gone back to your vehicle and there's a parking ticket on it. It's parking tickets are a contract. You do not have a contract with your council. They put a ticket on there. There's no contract, so you don't have to pay that ticket. So what are, what are your steps? You send the ticket back to them. No contract. And you tell them no contract. They have to produce a contract where you sign to say that if you park somewhere that you're not supposed to, you will have to pay the ticket. I remember someone showing me a ticket not so long ago, and the ticket had a CEO. It says CEO on the ticket and a signature. CEO? Yes. Chief Executive Officer? Yes. 
So I sent the ticket back to the CEO and I asked him when was he there at 8 o'clock at night putting tickets on the cars. <laughs> it just goes to show that people do not look at their tickets either because they're not, they don't know. And it's very sad because a parking ticket, why should you have to pay for parking when you own the roads? We own it. We own everything. So you've sent your parking ticket back with no contract on it. What are, what are the next steps that they're likely to take? They would write to you and said you have to pay. If you pay within a certain time, it's only half. You have to pay half of the, the fine. What's your response? My response is I don't have to pay any because I don't have a contract with you. So again, you ask them, show me the contract. Yeah. I send them a letter and I ask them, I said, okay, um, the person that you addressed in this letter is spiritually dead and have no soul, which is your strong the man. strong man. Yes. And I said that I had not given you permission to use it to make money. And, and there's a fine behind this of 250,000 pounds every time you use it. They refused to answer. So I send them, the following letter was a default letter. I says, you're now in default for not responding. Because that's what they're going to do to you. So you played law against them? Yes. Good. Yes. So when I sent them that, five days later, I receive a letter stating that I, the account is closed and I do not owe. Very good. Thank you for that. Well, that's rather straightforward. Let's discuss mortgages because this is the bane of most people's existence, is yes. needing to secure their home. Everyone has the right to a home in this world. And mortgages... I mean, this, what's the etymology of mortgage in the first instance? Death grip, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, Mor the, mortgage means death grip in French. Well, the mortgage is what they do is, is just a, a front. Because the minute you miss a payment, when you get a mortgage from the bank, is they're after you. The first time you miss a payment, it goes straight into the insurance company that the mortgage company have. And they want you to miss a payment. And they want you to miss a payment because they don't lend you money. But let's go back. Your house is, let's say, worth $100,000. Now, when you apply for a mortgage, they don't have the $100,000. But you come along with your block black capital signature. You sign the application. They then monetize your signature by having $100,000 worth of your value discharged against your treasury Trust. bond. Yes. That money, they then lend to you. Uh, and they double dip because they then get you to pay that money back plus interest. What they do is they don't lend you that. They don't lend you anything. They, they, you fill up your papers and you sign. The signature is what they want. Then they tell you, okay, you have to be a good boy and you have to be a good credit and you can borrow from me. So they lend you a piece of paper that you sign with very fine writing in the back. That's where the legalese comes in because that's what they do. Then you sign it, signature. They take that and they tell you, okay, um, the funds will be ready in two to three days to come back. The following day with the signature, they go into your trust fund and they get paid the 100000 They never disclose to you that, okay, we got paid, so the house is now yours. No. They come back when you go in the third day, they've already got their money, they say to you, okay, this is the agreement, you pay so much every month, the interest rate, all that you've already signed for. So now they put the 100000 on the on the computer screen for you, so you can finish your house closing. Now that 100000 is just numbers, it is not money, because they all own the banks. So there's no money pass, no cash, just paper. But they have your 100000 already. If you don't pay, they take the house. They don't want nothing. They want the property because the money is just paper. It has no value. So the property has value, so they take the property. So let's talk about allodium title. What is allodium title? Why is it so important? Okay, allodium title is important because you do not own the land. They tell you it's freehold, but it's not freehold. The land is owned by the crown. All the land Hang in on. England. I'm a farmer in Minnesota, and you're saying that my land 
is owned, owned by the Queen. Yes. I'm a farmer in Mozambique. Your land is owned by the Queen. The Queen of England. The Queen of England. She owns all the land. So what happens is you own that piece of brick that's sitting on it that they call freehold or your house. You own that. You don't own the land. So the land, the allodium title, is to own your land. So you can put a sign up and says no trespassing, private property. When you put that sign up, you have to own the land. Because owning the house doesn't mean anything. It's the land they want. See, the bank takes the house, which is part of the crown, and the crown owns the land. That's how it works. And you don't own anything. Ever. Ever. You are just a mere user. You so own. long as you are acting as your straw man. Now, when we reclaim ourselves from this fiction, and we do it as a people, mm -hmm. many of us do it, Yeah. what then do you see? How do you see the dissolution of government, the dissolution of this behemoth, this Molochite monster that has taken over our lives, indentured us into bonded slavery all around the world, seven billion souls owned and controlled, indentured to a couple of hundred national reserve banks themselves, indentured into the Bank of International Settlements, that controlled through the US Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the IFC, the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, back to the Crown of England, and behind that, the Vatican. So all of that grotesquery, that fiction, when do you see us as a people of the world reclaiming real reality from that fiction? And how is that likely to play out? I think if people get to know and they come together, it doesn't take hundreds of millions. One million sovereigns get together can make a hell of a lot of difference because the word spreads from one to the other. And once people get to know that this is what has been done to them, it's going to be like wildfire once people get to know the law, what they're under, and what they're doing to them, and how they're making... You see, they make things to distract you like the news and all this fake, all this stuff, television, and this is what they do. So once people can get together, if 100 people go to the bank and all keep taking out 100 pounds, before the end of the day, the bank will close. It's very simple if people get to understand what's going on. And, and it would be good for them to know because we need to stop this. We need to stop what they're doing to people, hurting people for no reason, making, put people in poverty. And by they, we're talking about the parent corporation. The parent corporation, The yes. banks and governments yes. were, and the justice systems all working to penalize and harvest humanity. Yeah, they're in bed together, everybody. They said, if they send you to the Citizens Advice Bureau, don't even bother to go because they're working too with them. Everybody they have in their pocket. And it's very sad because people will do things to other people for very little money. Are you hopeful for humanity? I am, very much so. Bibi Bacchus, thank you. I, think yeah. I love you, I do love you. <laughs>